The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. What? <laughs> We're skipping ahead in the talk. His Raspberry Pi case has a fan. This thing, my, uh, my Google chat status for a long time has been huddling over Raspberry Pi for warmth because it actually <laughs> does put off a little. So hello! Uh, my name is Ruth Seeley, and uh, this is Tom, and you can tweet rude things at us for the next hour or so. Uh, <laughs> and so this is both, if you know nothing about the Raspberry Pi and think that soft float might have to do with root beer and ice cream, that's okay. And if you already have a Raspberry Pi with a fan on it, I don't... I might not tell you anything, but some other people, we might tell some interesting things. Uh, and so at some point when writing this, I decided pie on your face was a good name. And if you know Larry Cafiro, he decided he needed to actually have a pie on his face. <laughs> so what's great about the pie, it's super cheap. You can slap it on a guy's face. And if for some reason his beard breaks it, I don't think that's likely. But it's OK, because it was 35 bucks, and you get a new pie. You put a new SD card. It's, it's all cool. But uh, let's start with a, a little history of the Raspberry Pi and where it came from. Uh, this cool guy named Evan Upton at the University of Cambridge's computer lab was actually worried about the declining computer skills of the students coming into the university. He uh, kind of looked around the classroom and went, eh, you guys could use some help. But then, of course, the solution to that is not to teach college students, but to educate people at, at younger ages. And so the Pi was designed to be an inexpensive computer and thus easy to get into the hands of children so that children would learn computer skills early on and eventually become much smarter students in his classroom. So around 2008, he was a chip architect at Broadcom and got together with some others. The, uh, the first Alpha boards came out in August of 2011, and then by January, the Model B manufacturing had started. And then they shipped in April. And if you were looking for one then, they were a lot harder to get than they are now. But, um, and then in October, just this past October, the new versions with 512 uh, megs of RAM came out instead of the 256. So he thought, um, you know, a few people will think this is pretty interesting. And so the first run was 10,000 boards. And the first day, they had 100,000 orders. And now there are more than a million out there. It's not, they're not hard to come by anymore. But uh, just to, for a little flashback, does anybody know what this is? A computer, it is! <laughs> Give that guy a prize! It was inspired by this thing, which is the BBC Micro, which came out in December of 1981, which may be before Computer Guy was born. <laughs> uh, and it also had a Model A and a Model B, which is where those names for the Raspberry Pi models come from. It had a 2 megahertz processor, and the Model A had 16K of RAM. It's very exciting. The Model B had 32. That is madness. But what's great, uh, you can see the inspiration. This is an ad for the, the micro, and it says educational uses in big letters. So the Raspberry Pi really is sort of his future vision of the, of the BBC micro. So let's talk about the, the actual Pi itself. If you haven't seen one, that's the, the big picture of the Pi uh, next to the SD card for scale. But this is, what, this is what's actually on it. You want to go through the list? You can say words, too. <laughs> Drop you. Yeah. So uh, brief hardware overview of what the what the Pi has on it. It has uh, I'm going to talk about the Model B because it's much more interesting than the Model A. Uh, but it has two USB ports. Uh, it has an Ethernet port built in. It has onboard audio that goes out a analog or HDMI. Uh, it has RCA and HDMI video out. Uh, it has several sort of standard connectors that you see on embedded boards, like DSI. Uh, but the coolest thing, in my opinion, is the GPIO headers that are attached to the board, which allow you to basically plug in or wire anything to the Pi and then control it directly from the operating system. Uh, the Pi is powered off of micro USB. So it doesn't take a lot of power. It has no onboard disk. It boots entirely off of the SD card. So it's a little bit different from what you might see in some other embedded style machines that actually have flash uh, on the board that it uses to boot off of. Yeah, the Pi boots entirely off of firmware written onto the SD card. It doesn't know how to do anything except look at the SD card in a specific point and load the firmware in from that. 
some days all it knows how to do is make you mad. No. Uh, so, but it's, it's not your super awesome gaming tower. It is not vast. I usually describe it as a really cool computer from 1997. What it's meant for is those educational purposes. And then all of us, people like you went, that's awesome, it's a tiny computer. I can build crazy crap with that. And that's what we'll show you later. And, but this idea, there's a flaw in this idea that it is a super cheap computer because it costs $35. But if you don't have all this other stuff, <laughs> it's suddenly not really that cheap of a computer. And then in addition to all this, you're going to need an Ethernet cable, and you might want a Wi-Fi dongle. And uh, I can't even tell you how much I've spent on Adafruit in the last couple of months buying random things to plug into the Pi. So if you have all these things on hand, it is a super awesome, cheap computer to give a kid. If you don't have all these things on hand, which is probably not true for most of the people in this room, uh, it, the case is different. So where do you buy all that fun stuff? The Raspberry Pi costs $35. Do not buy one on Amazon. There is not a $35 Raspberry Pi on Amazon. There are $50 Raspberry Pis on Amazon, and that's stupid. Uh, Element 14 is where you can get the actual $35 Raspberry Pi, but if you're gonna do fun stuff with it, you're gonna play with it, you're probably gonna wanna buy some cool toys to go with it, so you might as well to go to like Adafruit. Adafruit has all those extra cool toys, and they do things like, uh, we'll talk about the SD cards in a minute, but if you're too, say, easy to install a distro on your card. You can buy one pre-installed. They sell that. They sell the um, Adafruit's really good. They have their own distro and everything. So they're really good about designing things and selling things meant for the Pi. And so like they say they've tested about 11 billion Wi-Fi dongles and they have two that actually work. You don't have to buy 11 billion. You can buy the ones that they've already tested and assure you work and cost like 11.95. So, uh, but the point is, Adafruit sells the pie for $40, but if you're gonna buy all the other stuff, you might as well spend the extra five bucks. Uh, Makershed has a kit if you really wanna just buy, what is it, like $150 for the, the Makershed Introduction to Raspberry Pi kit, and it has a cobbler board and all sorts of other little toys that you can play with. Uh, that's a good thing. SparkFun doesn't sell them. SparkFun sells all sorts of other things. They sell the LEDs. I, I describe SparkFun as what you wish Radio Shack was, <laughs> except it's on the internet. They sell all the fun things, so you're not going to get a pie there, but you're going to find other fun stuff. Amazon is where you might buy like a missile launcher if you'd like to control that, you know, other toys. Um, and in a pinch Radio Shack, it does work. Like I, where I live, I have a super awesome Radio Shack that actually sells these things. We went in one here yesterday that was degrees less awesome and more like a cell phone store. I got a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and among those accessories is the camera. What, so the last time uh, I talked about the Pi back at scale, which I think was in February, the camera didn't exist yet. The camera does exist now. Yeah. So one of the connectors I was talking about is a dedicated uh, connector type that's standardized in the industry for things like cell phones and tablets so that they can tell manufacturers, hey, we want this specification set of camera at this price. And they'll come back and say, sure, we'll build you that. And they don't have to worry about how to connect it to the board because it's using a standard connector. It's not quite that simple, but for purposes of explanation, it is. Uh, so the Raspberry Pi has that standard connector type and they've added support in their firmware for a custom camera that they have just started producing. I tried very hard to get one, but after three hours of wrestling with a website that was continuously crashing from millions of Raspberry Pi users trying to get their hands on it, I was unsuccessful. But it looks exactly like this, and it's basically just a very small camera, uh, the same basic specifications you would find in a cell phone. Uh, except that the Raspberry Pi knows exactly how to drive it and, dis and uh, reveal it to the Linux operating system or to any operating system. And while we're talking about fun things that plug into it, it's a good time to mention that the Pi is not an Arduino in a lot of ways, but in, in this specific way, the Arduino has this vast almost ecosystem of things that are designed to be plugged into an Arduino. This thing does this specific thing with the Arduino. That doesn't exist for Pi yet. There is a shield, there's an Arduino shield that you put on the Raspberry Pi to use Arduino accessories with it, but it's not, it's not quite that kind of device. It is a tiny computer, it is not an Arduino, and I think a lot of people get a little confused, and they're like, well, they're, they're small, they look like hardware, it's kind of the same thing, right? But it, you, know, you have to decide what you need for the task that you wanna do. So let's talk about getting started. Uh, and, and the first thing is the right SD card, because that essentially is your hard drive here. Uh, and it makes the Pi awesome. This is one of the best things about using the Pi for education, and not even for kids, but if you know, you've been using Fedora for 10 years and you're like, well, what's up with these other distros? 
you can install 14 SD cards of all the different distros, and all you have to do is plug the next one into the Pi and try it out. You don't have to reinstall everything from scratch and spend all day doing it. You can have one Pi and 14 different things you want to do with it, and you just put in the extra accessories that you want to use. Uh, there is a list on uh, elinux.org has a, a great wiki full of all sorts of Pi information, and they have a list of SD cards that have been tested with the Pi. So it's nice to check across. Like, uh, there used to be a bug with the class 10 cards, and most of them didn't work. It tells you that they don't work with the, the micro SD cards with the adapter, except that's what, uh, is it Adafruit sells with them? It's, a, but it's we, a dirty lie. Yeah, we keep using them. Clearly, they do work. So that part is a lie. But in general, the list is nice to refer to. And um, also, uh, a lot of the cheap cards are noted as claiming to have more capacity than they actually have. So if you have something you think you're going to need a lot of room on your Pi's SD card, you should probably just pony up for a nice SD card. You pay, you pay $35 for your computer. You can buy a nicer SD card. Don't buy your SD cards oh. at Walmart. There, there's the Linux, the elinux.org link I was, I was mentioning. Do you have a, a couple of display options? You want to talk about those? Yeah, so uh, like I said before, it does have HDMI out. So it does 1.3 and 1.4 standard. Uh, you can't pass HDMI back into the device. It's a pure output port. Uh, but it does a very good job. It is audio and video integrated into it across the standard, and it, I haven't seen it fail yet. Uh, there's some stuff on the internet about various monitors that are not too smart about HDMI, not quite working properly. But the Pi firmware has things like overscan mode, uh, a lot of tweaking to try to get the dimensions right on the screen. And honestly, I've thrown a lot of really awful cheap monitors at the Pi, and so far all of them have worked with minimal tweaking. But it does have uh, old school connectors for the audio and the video, and they both work great. Uh, but there is no VGA, which is different from a lot of the other embedded hardware in the space. Uh, and mostly that was a cost and form factor decision, because if you've got a laptop from a couple years ago that has VGA, you can see that they get it to the thickness of the VGA port and no thinner. Uh, but thankfully, uh, they made the decision sort of to not worry about that. There's a lot of aftermarket kits out there to convert uh, any of the v ports on there to a VGA port. I've also seen some people who have done some real clever wiring to attach a, a VGA dongle to the GPIO ports, but I don't really recommend that. Um, there is a DSi connector on there so that you could put a proper screen on it, but uh, just the same situation with the camera. You've got to have the firmware on the Pi be able to uh, start the device so that the, the hardware is visible to the operating system, and currently there aren't any supported devices in the firmware. So that's something that uh, they plan on adding and releasing a, a screen for it, but you can't just take apart a cell phone or a tablet and shove it in there even though the connector is identical because it just won't work unless you feel like reverse engineering the proprietary firmware. There's also, uh, since part of what we're going to talk about is fun projects, there's one called the Kindleberry Pi where a guy hooked it up to use a Kindle as the screen because the Kindle uses micro USB. You plug it right into the USB port. It's, it's one of the most amusing blog posts. It's a detailed description. You can absolutely reproduce what he does. But he highly recommends you have a spare Kindle for this purpose and not your beloved reading device, and actually says things along the lines of, if you're an idiot, you should probably not undertake this task. He's really, he's very blunt in his instructions. <laughs> Touch screens. Yeah, so one of the first things I wanted to do with the Pi when I got it was give it a touch screen. And of course, my first thought was, hey, this DSi connector is great. I'll just take apart a tablet and shove it right in there. And that was how I learned more than I ever wanted to know about the firmware limitations of the Raspberry Pi. Uh, so instead, I started looking at uh, USB touchscreen devices. And one of the ones that had some good support out there was from a company called Mimo. Uh, so I got a Mimo 720. And that one is supported by the Display Link Frame Buffer Driver. It's actually a dis uh, Display Link uh, touchscreen. So it's using uh, a couple different drivers. Uh, the current Linux kernel has both the old Frame Buffer Driver and the kernel mode setting driver. Uh, the kernel mode setting driver has a few bugs in it. So when I started really getting into those bugs and I was trying to write patches for the Linux kernel, I said maybe I'm just going to step back and use the old frame buffer driver that's actually working. So I started doing that, and that works well with X. One of my thoughts was that I wanted to use a distribution called OpenELEC, which is a nice uh, interface for media playback. Uh, it boots basically into an entertainment system. So you can play games, music, movies, TV shows, video files, all these sorts of things. But because 
of how the open elect distribution doesn't actually include support in the kernel for these drivers. In order to do that, you're going to have to rebuild kernel drivers to get the touchscreen working. And they don't have any touchscreen drivers in their build. So, yes? It is. Tell us where you would find that kernel source, Tom. <laughs> So the nice thing about the Raspberry Pi is that uh, they have a pretty good commitment to open source and free software. Uh, everything but the firmware is out there with source code. And the firmware is something that they have an overinflated value of and will never release. So, uh, but the good news is, is that they have all the patches necessary to boot all the hardware and devices on the Pi in Git, in GitHub specifically. So there's a Raspberry Pi repo on GitHub then there's constant work going on there where they're merging changes from other people. It's a very active and healthy upstream. Uh, they have two branches. Uh, at the time this was written, there was, uh, you had to sort of pick one whether you wanted to be on 3.2.27 or you wanted to be on the 3.6 moving target tree. But the 3.2 tree is pretty dead now, so it's entirely a 3.6 tree. Uh, but you just start, you check it out, and you build it just like a normal Linux kernel. Now, everyone is sort of hoping that at some point they won't be a fork, that the patches will end up back in mainline. And some of the changes have, but not most of them. And when I talk to folks that do a lot more work in the Linux kernel than I do, the general feedback is that they don't think it's ever going to merge in. But you know, maybe, maybe you'll be the person that takes that task on and gets the rest of that work done. But uh, this is where I'm going to let Ruth tell a, a fun little story about the make Mr. Proper command. Aww. It's your fun story. So this is, I, I didn't say, perhaps I should have said this up front. The two of us are working on a Raspberry Pi hacks book for O'Reilly. And so learned all sorts of new things. But this was the, the fun fact as I was editing stuff he wrote. So it's actually his story about uh, this. Make Mr. Proper is like a super duper version of make clean. Do you know why it's called make Mr. Proper? Because that's the interna international name for Mr. Clean. <laughs> When, when Linus was doing the work, he said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add that bald face guy that's all in the cleaning solution, which is in, in where he is, Mr. Proper. Fun facts. You'll, you'll win your next Linux trivia contest. <laughs> so the next step, now you got your SD card, and, and perhaps we rambled too far on the kernel before we got to picking a distro. So obviously, we perhaps are a bit biased as Fedorans towards Pydora, which just got officially released a week and a half ago or so. Uh, and that's the version of Fedora optimized for the Raspberry Pi and has some fun features. But I also support choosing the distro that actually accomplishes what you want to do. And so, for example, I mentioned Adafruit has their own distribution, and it's called Occidentalis. And it is meant for uh, hardware hacking in particular. It adds in a bunch of jazz on top of Raspbian and Wheezy. Uh, if you want to build XBMC, RasBMC is a better choice. That's what it's designed to do. So, Definitely biased towards you choosing Pydora. And if you go like right across the hall to the Fedora booth, you can get a jazzy little Pydora sticker with a little Pi on it. Uh, but again, you know, choose the distro that is suited to your needs or that you like the name of the best Plan 9 from Bell Labs. There's a, and this is a tiny chunk of the list. There, is a, there are so many distros. People are like, I think I'll just build a new Raspberry Pi distro today. I think people have gone a little crazy. But so we'll tell you a little bit about Pydora. These are, um, some of here you talk about, it and I'll make it do stuff. <laughs> so, uh, Pydora is Fedora recompiled with the optimization targets specifically for the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi is an ARMv6 uh, with a hardware floating point unit. So, that's the optimization level it's compiled for. Uh, most of the ARM distributions out there, unless they're built for the Raspberry Pi, aren't optimized for the Raspberry Pi. Uh, the older ones are built ARMv5. Uh, Ubuntu doesn't have an ARMv5 build for it natively because all of their targets are ARMv7. And so it, their default ARM build won't even boot on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, but we added a tool for graphical configuration uh, to do things like resize the SD card to fits the entire, uh, the partition stretches across uh, the whole SD card so you're not wasting space to set up swap properly, to do memory allocation so that you can set how much memory goes to the GPU versus how much memory goes to the system. Uh, it's designed to be very small so it can f download quickly and then resize across the whole partition later. Uh, it does include C, Python, and Perl support uh, on the image by default so that you can immediately start writing code on it. Uh, and it also has the libraries uh, to support all the external hardware that you can plug into the device. Uh, it has all of the implementations that are out there for GPIO, I2C, SPI. 
Uh, and it also has a full graphical boot environment, uh, XFCE, uh, so that you can use all of the basic uh, minimal development tools that are out there for basically opening text files. So my favorite feature, I was when Pydora came out, it was the day after I had just turned in an article for Linux Magazine about going headless with the Raspberry Pi for all sorts of projects and what you could do. And so I'm totally going to fake this, because otherwise we have to boot it up and wait for it to work. But if you, tell, if you put a little file in the SD card that tells it you're going headless, then when you boot up, IP address 172.16. He tells you your IP address. And then, uh, and then actually flashes it out, the LEDs, on the Pi. I love this guy. Okay, you can stop now. <laughs> I do kind of like him. I could listen to him all day. I love that the pie turns out to be British. Who knew? She's going to get the pie to read all of her email. <laughs> no, I'm going to get him to read off IRC, like the meetings. I'm just going to have that guy. That seems like a bad I'll, idea. I'll tell people what channel she hangs out in later. You, self, no. Um, so Berry Boot. Uh, Berry Boot came out in February. Somebody said, the pie needs a bootloader. Oh, look, let's make it easy for you. Uh, were you reading about it earlier? Do you yeah. want to add anything? It basically is a very minimal environment that draws that box and is a bootloader. So for all of you people who love bootloaders, bootloader. <laughs> <laughs> so there's an ARM installer utility uh, that, that is, was done by Fedora, uh, but it should run anywhere. Uh, Debian has one as well. Uh, and it's just a graphical way you can say, this is my SD card, this is the image I want to put on it, or pick one from the drop-down box, and it will go ahead and do the DD out to the SD card. Uh, but again, like I said, you can just use DD if you're feeling dangerous and brave. Yeah, but pretty graphical installer does it all for you. It's super easy. And, and it actually, so if we're going to talk about slight faults and things, it seems to work better for me if you go ahead and download the image. It claims that it will go out and get it for you, and half the time it will, or you could just download the image and point it to it. There are no bugs. There are, no, there are never bugs. Uh, I tell you what to do on a Mac, but I assume you're all using Linux and don't need it. No. <laughs> but uh, there, are, there are Raspberry Pi builders, similar things for Macs, and, uh, and then Berry Boot, you can do that. Or, like I said, you could just buy a preloaded card with uh, any of a number of things, and we're told, do you know when? Uh, Real soon now. Element 14, right? And a whole bunch of other people. Are going to start selling a multi-boot SD card with uh, Raspbian and Wheezy and Pydora and something else. I believe they're calling it the noobs SD card. The <laughs> but that's awesome, because then the, the noobs can, well, I guess the noobs have to pick, but eh, maybe they'll all pick Pydora. It'll be fantastic. So let's talk about power. This bad boy is five volts, unlike your Arduino toys. And this is a really good reason why all of you with iPhones should go buy Android phones, because if you had an Android phone, you already have a Pi power supply, because that's what it uses, is that little micro USB slot. Uh, your laptop's USB port isn't going to work. That is not going to power it. Uh, but you can get the jazzy little power bricks that are handy at conferences to power your phone when they die right in the middle of the party and you want to take a picture of somebody doing something stupid. Um, and you just plug your little power brick in, that will power the Pi too. It's a handy dandy power supply. You should not, you look like you want to add something. I was just going to say that, you know, to get a little lower level on why 5 volts is important here, the Pi is extremely sensitive to uh, voltage drop and you really want to give it as clean of a power and as much of a power as you can because if the power drops, it just turns off. Yeah, and you have two USB ports, but you're going to want a hub, and you're going to want a powered hub, even okay. though we haven't plugged this one in, so I sound like I'm lying. Yeah, well, we don't have very much draw coming off of the Pi right now, so. Volt what's that? Voltage is part of the formula of current. The other one, so what's the current draw? 300 milliamps. Okay. All right. I may have been there. What was the question? 300 milliamps. Yeah, what was, he, he asked, he asked what was the current draw on it, and the answer is 300 milliamps. Yes, you want, you want a one amp. And mostly, <laughs> mostly your good power supplies are going to be one amp. Uh, yeah. But if, if you're having problems, like if you think, huh, my Pi's not coming on, maybe you should check your power supply. So, you know, don't go to the dollar store and buy the cheapest Android charger they have. That's yeah. probably not the best place. A lot of the early reports about wireless devices not working properly were entirely due to them drawing way too much power and the Pi saying, okay, I'm only going to give you the bare minimum that I have left to keep myself afloat, and those devices just going, eh, I don't see what I'm doing right, I'm not working. Most of the power supplies are designed for 5.00 volts, and they have a little bit of drop on the cable, that's why they have the trouble. Adafruit sells an $8, 5.25 volt yep. supply that works perfect. 
Adafruit is awesome. I always sound like I am a commercial for Adafruit, and they're giving me no money, they, like as much stuff as I've bought. Although if you spend $300, you get a free Raspberry Pi. Um, so what, 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 the person in, what the person in the audience was saying is that, uh, is that the power supplies that they come with phones and tablets and things tend to not give you the sort of draw that you want. You want to try and get a really nice one that's specifically rated at a uh, 5 volts, 1 amp, or close to it, and you can get that from Adafruit. They have an excellent cheap one, cheap in price, not quality. Yeah, yeah. nice doesn't also have to be expensive. And so then the last bullet point, for those of you who have not yet played with a Pi, I was going to try to lift this up, except we plugged it into a bunch of things. If you can see right by the power slot, there's this cool little silver cylinder. It looks really neat, doesn't it? That's not a thumb holder for plugging in your power cord. It looks like it is, but then that's how just about everybody who plays with a Pi breaks it off. And it's the little capacitor that is for this whole power situation. And your Pi will almost certainly continue to work. Um, but if you decide to solder a new one on, this is the term that you'll need to Google, and you've now voided your warranty. Just don't break it off. So the Pi has a little series of LEDs, and they're a little different. If you have a significantly older one, they, they changed a bit. But the LEDs tell you all kinds of things. And this is a lot of information, but it's all on the internet. Uh, that elinux.org, so much Raspberry Pi information, highly useful. But when you plug it in and go, what didn't happen? The LEDs tell you what didn't happen. Red light means your power supply sucks, or you didn't plug it in because you drank too much at the self party last night. Uh, and, and then the others have to do with the files that it needs to find on the SD card in order to boot and whether or not it found them. There are four files that it needs to find. Rainbow screen means your firmware is loaded, but nothing else did. It's pretty, though. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about, we talked a little bit about GPIO. GPI GPIO stands for general purpose in and out, and that's what it is. It's general purpose. You, this is what makes the Pi awesome. You can make it do cool other things because you have all of these pins. But then you look at those pins, and if you've looked at the Pi, you're like, eh, I'm going, uh, I need a map. And so this guy has created this thing called the Raspberry Leaf, which quite possibly is one of the most ingenious things anybody has done with the Raspberry Pi. <laughs> you print it out, you cut around the little rectangle, you lay it on the GPIO, and look, now you know what number all your pins are. I'm so distracted by the Raspberry Leaf, I can't say anything useful about GPIO. Would you like to? Sure. So, uh, GPIO, uh, basically, uh, the pins, some of the pins have special meanings. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about the special meanings on the pins. But basically, the nice thing about the GPIO pins is that you can directly wire them into other things and then control them manually from user space, either using one of the libraries that are out there in C, C, Python, Perl, or you can actually uh, directly bit bang them to life through uh, slash sys. You just create little nodes for each one of the pins, and you tell it if it's input or output, and then you start, you know, catting commands at it, and it does things. Uh, so what we've got wired up here uh, today is uh, a breadboard is wired to the GPIO. I'm actually using all of the general input-output pins without remapping anything. Are you gonna do the thingy? Uh, yeah. This is why you shouldn't sit in the back. <laughs> This is like the most basic thing you could possibly do with a Pi. Stick some LEDs into a breadboard and make them go blinky. <laughs> Thank you, Vanna. <laughs> so uh, what I've done is I've wired up a simple push button switch to it. Uh, I've got uh, one, two, three, four, five uh, one color LEDs and one tricolor LED. And I just wrote a little Python script to listen for the input from the switch and to trigger it to walk the colors up and down. That last LED keeps coming loose, and that's why it's not lighting. Uh, and then the it's going to do its snake thing, and then it's going to cycle its color, uh, its three colors up and down, and then it's going to do the full spectrum fade. Now, the way that that RGB LED works, if you know electronics at all, is that it's a cathode anode LED. It has four pins instead of two, and the way that you cycle it up and down is using something called pulse width modulation. Now, a lot of the embedded hardware has pulse width modulation hardware support across all the pins. The Raspberry Pi does not. The Raspberry Pi has one pin that does hardware pulse width modulation. But never fear, the software library for Python has software support for pulse width modulation, pulse width modulation. And uh, so I used that to do the fades and the transitions. You just basically tell it to clock up and clock down on the increments you want and shove it in a loop, and there you go. Pretty shiny blinkies. But 
this is just to demonstrate that any sort of wiring concept that you need that is in the 3.3 or 5 volt range you can do, it actually has a pinout for 5 volt, but I recommend that you start small with your projects because there's a lot of people that discover very quickly as they try to draw 5 volt off the Pi that the Pi just runs out of power and turns itself off. So you want to be careful with those projects. It is possible to do that. You can also do fun things like actually uh, supply power to the Pi over GPIO as opposed to over the mini USB, but that is an excellent way to cook your Pi. And there's no over voltage protection. Did we cover that? Yeah, it, it, if you pass power back through the GPIO, it has no safeties like it does in the mini USB connector, which is why the Pi just goes poof, magic smoke. <laughs> So, it, yeah, this is your chapter, just keep talking. All right. <laughs> Building a cross compiler. So one of the first things you're going to discover when you say, okay, I'm going to get this, I'm going to put a little MP3 player on it, I'm going to play me some tunes, it's going to be good times, and then you're like, holy crap, this thing is compiling forever. So what you want to do is you want to build a cross compiler. Uh, a lot of the distributions already have ARM cross compilers pre-built. Don't bother. You're not going to get the best optimized case for the Raspberry Pi. You're going to want to build your cross compiler from scratch. Now, back in my day, now, when I started doing cross compilers first, which was a long, long time ago, uh, it was a much more involved process that it was full of profanity and screaming and throwing things. But some nice gentlemen uh, and ladies built a tool called Cross Tool NG, and Cross Tool NG gives you the uh, wonderfully bad user experience you get from the NCURSE's kernel configuration menu. But uh, it's a reasonably straightforward process where you tell it what you're trying to optimize for in your targets and your hardware, and then it goes through and churns and builds you a cross compiler. And then that cross compiler is set up with the default optimization flags for the hardware that you've set. So you can take this, then sit it out. You get an ARM cross compiler that's optimized for the Pi, for the best case. And then you just build all your code with that using sort of standard cross compile techniques. So let's say you want to build a kernel. I just, want to build a kernel. All right. You just get your kernel source from the upstream. You pass the cross compiler to it. The Linux kernel already understands cross compilers. It's not going to be too confused by this. And then the resulting kernel that you build much, 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 much faster than you would on the Raspberry Pi, you get it done on your machine, you copy it over onto your SD card, you shove it in, voila, new kernel. I should totally compile on the Pi, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're bored or you need an excuse to tell your boss, I, it's still building. I just... <laughs> Since yesterday. I, I, more coffee. Uh, you said you wanted LibreOffice on this thing, right? I mean. So I, while he did that, I used my psychic powers to put your thoughts on my next slide, where you just want to see cool things people did with it. What are make people making besides plugging LEDs into it, making them blink? Cases, good place to start. Because so I, I was talking about cases one time, and somebody said, "Well, it comes with a great case." And I'm like, "Where did you buy yours from?" He's like, "No, the cardboard box. I just cut little holes in the sides to plug stuff into." <laughs> that is an option. Or you could 3D print one, or you could 3D print one. Wow, that was excellent timing. Good work. <laughs> uh, or you could build a fantastic one out of Legos, which is not bigger on the inside. Indeed. Uh, you can buy one. Everybody sells cases, some of them better than others. Like the one that comes in that uh, Maker Shed $150 kit I was mentioning kind of just goes, I have a <coughs> Crap. <laughs> Uh, but there are lots of them for about 10 bucks that are really nice. Or you can, people have built some really fantastic really nice cases. I opted to steal my children's Legos and uh, did an perhaps a bit too much research into how Lego should happen. So uh, a Lego square is eight millimeters on each side. And if you figure out how big the pie is, you need a baseboard that is nine by 13. There is no such thing as a nine by 13 Lego baseboard, but you don't want a giant one. And let, well, we'll get to that. So <laughs> I started doing, these are configurations of two layers of half-height Lego so that you can make your own baseboard to build up on the Pi. Or uh, you could just buy a kit that somebody already designed. And <laughs> I'll put the slides online. You can grab that. Or you can just uh, you Google the daily break, the Raspberry Pi Lego case that comes up. But so the thing with this, I mentioned I may have been a little too involved in the whole Lego thing. This costs 14 pounds. You have to order it from over the ocean, which is, say, $21-ish. There are 87 bricks, which comes out to 24 cents per brick. And it's quite possible that at some point I had a little too much time on my hands and compared the price per brick in a variety of sets as compared to going to the Lego store and compiling. So you should get below 10 cents per brick. And this is 24 cents per brick. So really, you break into your kid's Lego stash. You're going to do a heck of a lot better. 
Uh, you can get the little hinge door pieces to put over all of the ports if you want to make a super <laughs> snazzy one. It, I left the Star Wars sets intact. I am only using loose Legos, I swear. <laughs> Uh, if you use transparent bricks over the LEDs, you can still see what they're doing when you use the crappy power supply. It's fabulous. But uh, the last thing that I swear I will say about Legos, we could talk about this all afternoon, uh, it's going to be uneven because the Legos are uneven, the bottom of the pie is uneven, it's a little shaky. So there's this awesome stuff called Sugru, S-U-G-R-U. And you can make little Sugru nubbins to go in there and you have a fabulous even case. Although if you do buy this one, you get the little, you get the little raspberry on top and that's kind of cute. Well, I just have one question. Did yeah. Oh, we'll see. That's a whole other. <laughs> we'll talk. Moving on. We'll have a chat afterwards. No, but if you would like to Google this information, so I, I blog for a site called Geek Mom. If you Google Geek Mom Lego prices, I have a chart comparing the price per brick of sets since the beginning of Lego. You can read all about price per brick, but aim for lower than 10 cents per brick. That's my advice. The first step is admitting you have a problem. <laughs> So he said the first thing he wanted to do was a touch screen. The first thing I wanted to do was cram all of this stuff in an old Game Boy case. The first problem you have with this is not the tiny screen which Adafruit sells. God, they really should give me some kickbacks. Uh, the first problem is that Game Boy cases are screwed together with tri-tip screws. Who has one of these things? <laughs> she does. You should come over. Everyone in the room has that screwdriver Please. but us. No. So <laughs> We were in the Red Hat office where all the engineers are, and you would think we could be able to find a tri-tip screwdriver. It didn't go well. So I actually, I got a drill. Like, I drilled out the holes to pry the screws out. But yeah, so this is it hacked together. I haven't quite crammed it back into the case because the joystick I bought was too big to get through that hole, but found a teeny tiny joystick that may or may not work on Adafruit. Going to add Sugru, which I mentioned with the Legos, to that to make an actual little... You have an idea? I'm open to joystick ideas here. We can talk about the buttons. But you can see it totally works. And even better, this screen is so nice. Um, when we did this, he was on the other side of the room. He's like, read me the IP address. That screen is two and a half inches. It's the size of the Game Boy screen. I was like, are you unhinged? But it, no, that screen is really nice. I totally read the little IP address off there. So I've been calling this Pie Boy. If you add a P to Pie Boy, you get somebody else had the idea of a Fallout Pip Boy. Uh, and so somebody totally built this. He's like, this is my Halloween costume, Raspberry Pit Boy. It didn't make it the whole night. Is this, oh no, this is the still intact version. <laughs> oh, it's really hard to see. It suffered. It didn't make it through the night, so he's working on rebuilding it. But he did a really good job. And so you can, uh, you can go to his blog there and, and check out the whole Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi Pit Boy? Pit Pi, yeah. Anyway, but it died. Might have had something to do with that bottle of vodka he's holding. The next thing we did was start emulating games. And this was awesome for us. You can, you can buy uh, USB versions of all the old controllers to play all sorts of things. Uh, and so we went to Maker Fair in New York last fall. And uh, it, it's huge. It's, what, 100,000 people or something? And we'll get to the part in a minute where we had a Raspberry Pi photo booth, and this guy was in a really hot penguin suit. You may have seen him here last year. Uh, and so occasionally you take off the penguin suit and kids will come by. We would set up Mario so people could have something to do in our booth. Inevitably, this is what happens. Every single time, a kid would come by, say 11 or 12, and be like, oh, is that Mario? Can I play your Mario? Be like, hey, you can play my Mario. He'd come over and be like, it's Mario 2. So you start out with that little tower thing and you have to figure out how to get down and get to the next level. Two seconds, your Mario sucks. Yeah. It, Walk it, away. Inevitably, Every time. inevitably, child walks up. Is this the new Mario? No. <laughs> yes, yes it is. No, it's not. But yeah, there, uh, oh, do you want to talk about the MAME emulator? Because it's a little different. Yeah. Uh, show of hands, everybody knows what MAME is. Okay, we don't need to talk about it. We can do that on the pie. <laughs> uh, like I said uh, repeatedly, the, the pie was designed for education. The reason it is named Raspberry Pi is because it was meant to teach Python. Aha! Uh -huh. Uh, and so there are two super awesome books for doing this. The first is good for teaching kids programming skills in general, and that's what this is a picture from. It's called Super Scratch Programming Adventure. And I imagine many of you are familiar with Scratch, but if you're not, uh, you can see here, it uses these little puzzle pieces, and the, the bits of programming fit in the puzzle pieces so the kids see how it fits together. My seven-year-old can do it. That's the kind of skill level we're talking. If you can read, you can probably handle Scratch. And so the way this book does it is the left side is a page of a comic book. And then the right side, you're solving whatever has happened in the comic book, you're solving their problems by making a program. And at the end of the book, you have a video game you can play. And what's cooler when you're a kid than making your own video game? 
Uh, the other book that's really awesome for this is called Python for Kids. Uh, and I believe, I'm not, I haven't checked this in a while, but uh, if you go to the No Starch website, you could get 30% off of both of these with RPI as the code for Raspberry Pi, which is pretty cool. And, and I don't get anything from them either. I just know they're cool books. I have them. I get 10%. <laughs> How do I get in on that deal? There is a Pi store this launched back in December, and it, the goal of this was to get kids programming. It's built on Indie City, and so it uses their content ratings. There's a cool thing on there called Raspberry Invaders that's kind of like Space Invaders, and it teaches kids to build a game, because again, what do kids want but to build a game? And then it also teaches them all those open sourcey concept, concepts like sharing, and uh, there, you can have licenses on here. It's super familiar to kids who already know how to go to the Google Play Store or the iTunes Store or Steam or whatever. Um, but they, they, they start to learn those concepts of reviews and checking something out before you buy it and all those extra skills besides just the programming stuff. It's pretty cool. The next thing I, I decided I wanted to do was uh, back a long, long time ago, I was running the, you know, do you remember the old SETI at home screensaver? You would run the little screensaver and hope that maybe you found some aliens. I love how many heads are nodding. Yeah, I had that screensaver. That was good times. Well, so they kind of scrapped that project, and it was reborn uh, in a new version, but you can just totally dedicate a Pi to hunting for aliens. The project's still going. Why not? Um, or you could have a Pi farm of them hunting for aliens. And you could build your pie farm on a Lego board, because you can get a 50 by 50 brick Lego board. <laughs> I, you know, I, I haven't actually done that. But OK, so I'm going to go home. I'm going to build a pie farm on a Lego board. I'm going to tape those little pictures of pies on top of each one of them. And the next time I do this, I'll have a picture just for you. Deal? All right. Another guy who is dedicated to nerddom has decided he needs to build a Raspberry Pi Stargate. What is? This man has dedicated some serious attention to detail. If you go to his, his WordPress page, the attention he has paid to the little markings all the way around the Stargate, I'm afraid somebody's going to tell him it might not work. Yeah, he, he, has a, he's a, he has a request for people to send him Naquita, so it's a... Uh... <laughs> what if he is Entirely possible. Pi FM is a sassy little project that turns your Pi into an FM radio. You can play sounds out of it to a radio, which you should you know, check your local laws before amplifying in any significant fashion. But uh, it uses the, the Pi's onboard clock manager and uses it to produce whatever frequency you like with all sorts of math that you don't have to understand to use it. You just follow their fantastic directions. It uses one of the GPIO pins as an antenna. <laughs> Yeah, it, he says it works to about 10 feet, unless you add an extra antenna. Yeah, which is, which is a piece of wire tied to the pin. <laughs> yeah, it's very fancy, very high tech. Oh, look, I did the math for you. Hey, are you all excited about the math? Ah, oh, OK, we can go back to the Lego TARDIS. I mentioned we did a photo booth. Uh, that's, that's me in the foreground and Tux here in the background. <laughs> This, uh, this actually might have been the actual first thing we did with the Raspberry Pi, but it runs on a, a super simple little Python script that uses Gphoto to detect your camera, and you press Enter, and it produces, well, your picture, for one. It takes your picture with the penguin, and then outputs it to the screen with this little web page. And so you scan your, your uh, QR code, and you get to download your picture, but then also maybe hear about how fantastic Fedora is, or you know whatever else you want to put in that web page. <laughs> Uh, what most people seem to do with it is build uh, an XBMC little home theater system, uh, it, and it seems to work fine for that. Have you, you've done that. Yes. I mean, it's, it's powerful enough because uh, the CPU unit isn't powerful enough to do real-time decoding, but the hardware itself, because it's using a system on a chip, has dedicated hardware resources to do specific file types and uh, codec types. Uh, by default, it comes with support for H.264. So it can decode that out of the box. You can buy a couple other uh, codec support, and basically you pass uh, a little key to the firmware. I know that sounds really old school and proprietary, but that's how it works. And then it enables the hardware to natively decode other formats. So 
you don't have to actually have the CPU doing anything. It's decoding that in hardware, which is very fast. And then it just pipes it over uh, HDMI. And we've demonstrated it doing full, full screen, uh, 1080p encoded quality video uh, with no delay, with no stutter at all. And will it function as a Stargate? Only if you have an Acrota. <laughs> So that's, uh, that's uh, some of the, the good examples. I have a couple more, but I, I feel like uh, at this point, the last time I did this, a couple of people were like, I don't know any of the acronyms you said for the last 20 minutes, and I'm horrified. So I found this little snippet. Can you do this? This guy, that may be really hard to read, especially in the back, but this was a comment on uh, the Raspberry Pi wiki, I think, and he said, within three minutes, I've opened a package containing my Pi, found an SD card in a drawer, Googled Raspberry Pi XBMC, installed at RasBMC on the card, booted it, and it works! And he says, I haven't even figured out who's behind it, but whoever you are, I love you. It's easy. Like, anybody can do this. And then the stuff you don't know, you learn. You figure it out. You learn about Mr. Clean. A few people have wanted to put... Android on their Raspberry Pis, which I still think is a mysterious choice, and yet everyone has valid choices to make in life. So it is possible to run CyanogenMod 7.2. Uh, it's not awesome. CyanogenMod 9 is not usable at all. Uh, but if you're interested in this, it's Razdroid. R-A-Z Droid is their channel, uh, and they'll totally help you do that. Keep in mind that ARM v6 is slow and old. Yeah, this is not a recommended option, but it is theoretically possible, which actually applies to a lot of Raspberry Pi projects. This is not the best idea you've ever had, but what the heck? Build it's, yourself a Stargate. It, it's $35. Go kill it. Yeah, why not? Let's cram it into a Game Boy case. We don't have anything else going on. This is the, uh, the uh, Arduino bit that I mentioned. I think, is it called ice cream? Is that why I wrote that? I think it is. Uh, and so you just slap it on. You can use the Arduino shields like so. This is my favorite, best Valentine's gift ever. This year for Valentine's Day, this guy made his girlfriend a bilingual R2-D2 that uses face recognition. It has motion and distance detection, and it records and plays back messages. It's an actual little functioning R2-D2. That guy wins. <laughs> That's it. It's, uh, it's pie a la mode is the name. That's why I said ice cream. Sometimes by the end of your slides, yeah. This guy has tinier fingers than I do, so you can see the lighter for scale and the teeny tiny little arcade machine. Like, I thought crammed into a Game Boy was a crazy idea. It's an it's a arcade cabinet for ants. Yeah. For your ant farm. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> and finally, fish pie. This is actually a, a reasonably functional use of the Raspberry Pi that is actually being used for research. It, uh, it's used to guide and control a solar-powered surface vehicle on the water. And you can see their high-tech waterproofing Tupperware. I was very disappointed it was not used to mind control fish. <laughs> and this is what I want to build next. And yeah, so this was one of those, this is my lesson with Raspberry Pi. As soon as I have the idea, I should totally build an X. I Google Raspberry Pi X and discover somebody else already did it. Uh, and so we, uh, we were at a FUDCon in Paris back in the fall and went to the world's greatest bar, which I can totally tell you about later. Uh, and they had this old, do you remember these old arcade cabinets? I call it the Pizza Hut table because it's the only place I ever saw them. But it flips the game, player one, player two, with the person sitting across from you. I'm like, we could totally build this with the Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi Pizza Hut table, which apparently is what other people call it too. There it is! Coffee table pie playing Donkey Kong. Pizza Hut table. So that's my, my list of cool projects, and that's a few resources you can hit for uh, making your own awesome stuff, which I'd, if you've already built awesome stuff, like there's a fan on your pie, that's still pretty cool. Uh, we'd love to hear about it. Adafruit has a massive wiki with all sorts of tutorials for how to do things. eLinux, I've said a hundred times. Instructables has a few, not quite as many. Uh, Beginner's Guide to Raspberry Pi is already out. That's an O'Reilly book that gets you started with the basic stuff. And then theoretically, our hacks book comes out in August, the internet tells me. And that's where you can find us. Any questions? I think my Pi card or my SD card was one of those tens you were talking about. The class 10 cards? Yeah. You should try a new card. Put that one in your camera. Get a slower one? Yeah, <laughs> basically. Yeah. No, uh, I thought they fixed that bug, though. Have you tried it? Yeah. 
Yeah, just try. Cards are cheap. Just get you a new card. Well, it, it is, it is, but some it's somewhat harder if you're not ordering off the internet to get the older cards now because the stores are tending to carry the newer classics and higher cards just by default. Yeah, so. I think I mostly use sixes. So a four or a six would be better. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Stick the ten in your camera, it's better put to use there anyway. Fast pictures. I might be a camera nerd instead. Is Python uh, the right choice of programming for it then? That's what they intended, but because it's a full Linux operating system environment, you can use whatever your heart feels like. With no special conveniences to using Python. It's a, it's a tiny computer. Not really. I mean, uh, some of the hardware specific stuff like the GPIO access for the Raspberry Pi, there's a Raspberry Pi specific Python module for accessing the GPIO pins that understands how it works and the labels and the special functionalities of it. But uh, aside from that sort of modular functionality add, there really isn't any uh, differentiator. Yeah. What happened to the original Fedora port for um, the Raspberry Pi? What happens when you run it off Fedora what Core? Happened to the original port, because there was one that there was one that was, it came off Raspberry Pi and then it uh, got scraped. So the original Fedora Remix for the Raspberry Pi, there was a couple releases of that. Uh, that was done by some students at Seneca College, and. It was just taking the previous ARM builds for Fedora that were ARM v5 optimized and then combining them with some of the add-on software to do things like set the memory mappings and the uh, resizing of the partition. But it wasn't optimized for the Pi and every little bit of optimization helps that little uh, engine go faster. So uh, they stopped working on that uh, around the same time that Fedora announced they were gonna drop support for ARM v5 and started rebuilding all of the packages for ARM v6 hard float with the specific hardware pi, uh, Raspberry Pi optimizations. And that's why that old one that was slow and not optimized stopped being produced. And the new one, which is called Pydora, has the optimization is specific and it's really only going to work on the Raspberry Pi. I also forgot to mention when I was talking about cool projects, the big wooden thing on the table. Give Joe the microphone and let him. This is, so if you didn't see his talk yesterday, uh, this is the Alcyone. Do you, want to, do you want to explain about your MIDI controller? It's a cool project. Um, it's basically just a MIDI, well, OK, fine. It's basically a MIDI foot controller that's built with the Pi. It's using I2C. Um, it's actually written with, with, um, with C++, so it's, you know, Python is not required. Um, it's actually very, very fast, even though the, the Pi itself is very slow. I mean, in terms of what you're used to working on a desktop or even a cheap laptop, this thing crawls. But the latency is actually easily well enough for live music. It's been used on stage. It's you know worked fantastically as a controller. I thought we should start this talk by using it to play the Reigns of Castamere to make the Game of Thrones fans cry because that's what I like to do in my spare time. But we didn't plug it in. Pardon me? Yes. Uh, the schematics for this are online, and I'm actually going to flesh them out further so you can actually do it yourself. Um, they're on my blog on enigmastation.com. Um, we should also be posting them on community.redhat.com. And they will be. There's, there'll be an article on community.redhat.com soon. Shorter to remember. Absolutely. Whatever you're ready. Any other questions? I saw another hand. Did you change your mind? Wherever it went? Okay. Well, thanks for coming. Thank you very much. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again. 
this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in DigiM's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. 
if you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how Cloud Stack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of Cloud Stack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. Then, as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast; uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project, is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication from Wicked.